produce 1,900 per year that show up in the classrooms. 2,815 teachers also return to the classrooms. That is a net loss of 3,300 teachers every year. If that trend were to continue, it would eventually lead to zero teachers. And indeed, if it were to continue, it would probably accelerate. We've got to put a stop to it. In the meantime, with our current teacher shortage, which under current trends will grow substantially, unfilled teachers' places have to be taken by others, such as long-term substitutes with no training. We found one school where all teachers in the first grade where students have to learn to read were long-term substitutes. To properly teach reading requires a high level of training. Many of those students will probably not learn to read in the first grade. Research shows that if not, they will still be struggling in fourth grade. With the trend I described, more and more of our students would be taught by teachers who are not fully trained. If we do nothing to reverse this trend, this could be a major catastrophe for our students and our economy that needs a skilled workforce. I can tell you two things we can do to prevent this from happening. The first one, obviously, is salary. In the private sector, if a company cannot get the skilled workers it needs, it is forced by the marketplace to raise salaries. This is the way the private sector works. We need to deal with this public sector crisis as people in the private sector are required to do to meet an emergency in the private sector. This is the reason I supported a 10% raise for teachers last legislative session and now am supporting the proposal of the majority leadership to raise teacher salaries. Further adjustments will be made, need to be made in future years to reach market equalization as would be true in the private sector. The second thing we must do is equally important. In the Department of Education, we poll teachers who leave teaching. We give them choices for why they left teaching. They could agree to more than one, so the percentages add up to more than 100%. 67% gave salary as one of the reasons. That is obvious. But a close 61%, 67%, 61%, is close 61%, gave a second reason. Quote, I was not supported in the area of student behavior and discipline. I believe this is not a problem of the administrators, but of school boards that instruct them to be lenient. Not all, obviously, but some. In my state of education speech last year, I, try, I read to you a letter from a teacher who was told to F off when she asked the student to do her work, but the student didn't use the letter, he used the word. The teacher called administration, and they told her to use social-emotional learning. Then she was told to document restorative justice. Neither of those things create a disincentive to misbehavior. Students want boundaries, but if they see one student getting away with misbehavior, they all start to do it. Students cannot learn in that atmosphere. Working conditions for the teacher become impossible, as we've seen from the responses to our surveys and the Teachers Association has similar responses and surveys that they have done. We have a really serious problem with some of the school boards in this state, as conclusively demonstrated in that survey. My top priority for you, my top priority for you, because it deals with our most urgent and possibly catastrophic, catastrophic problem, is the following proposed bill, which you will be taking up today, and I very much hope you will be, uh, will be passing and I'm going to uh, describe it as we expect it to be amended. District offices are to be required to keep records of when teachers ask principals for discipline and whether or not the principals supported the teachers. If the percentage of supporting teachers is less than 75%, without a reasonable explanation in an appeal process, the first year the school will get a warning and the second year they would lose one level in, in the A3, A through F grades. Uh, our original proposal was two levels. We found people preferred one level, so we changed, so there'll be an amendment to make. I think there'll be an amendment to make it one one level. This is strong medicine, but it is needed to prevent the catastrophic hemorrhaging of teachers continuing. 
Some people may have a philosophical problem with this remedy, but we will furnish the survey to anyone who's interested to, to see it is absolutely necessary. I believe this will do more than anything to help teachers and to help raise student achievement. And I hope very much that you will pass that bill today. I, uh, when I'm done, you can ask me questions about it, and I'll also be available when the bill comes up if you have any other questions you want to ask me about it. Let's move to a more cheerful topic. We are undertaking a major expansion of our career technical education program. We refer to it as CTE, what used to be called vocational education, to be sure that every student graduates either college or career ready. This state has a very large number of great companies. But business leaders tell me the biggest problem we have is we are hampered by a shortage of skilled workers. Raising academics will enable more students to go to college, but not everyone will go to college. We organized a commission called the Arizona Education Economic Commission. We entered in a, into an agreement with the leaders of the major companies in our state. We will provide skilled workers. In return, the businesses will either teach our teachers how to teach the skills they need to hire people, or they will provide people to teach those skills. We started with a core group of 20 industry leaders from this state's largest corporations. Examples of members of this group include TSMC, the Taiwanese company that produces semiconductors and is making a $41 billion investment in Arizona, Banner Health, Arizona's largest employer, Raytheon, one of the world's largest aerospace and defense contractors, U-Haul International, one of the world's largest logistics and transportation companies, and Lucid Motors, one of the nation's largest electric vehicle manufacturers. Also participating are all 14 of our state's career technical education districts and Phoenix Union, which is its own career technical education district. We are now opening up the benefits of this initiative to all companies, provided that they can have a group of companies in the same industry to form a committee. When I last, ha when I last held this office between 2003 and 2011, we combined the CTA standards with the academic standards. As a result, the reading proficiency rate is 6% above the other students. CTE students, 6% above the other students. Math proficiency is 6.5% above the other students. And their graduation rate is 94.4% compared to 74% of other students. This, that's of students who complete the CTE program. Many CTE students go on to college using the skills they have learned to help work their way through. With the enthusiastic support of all of America's, Arizona's major industries, this Department of Education is going to solve Arizona's shortage of sufficiently skilled workers. The next item uh, is item one, improvement teams. After I'd been elected, but before I took office, I received an email from a consultant who specializes in failing schools. He told me that the failing schools had had no help in years. He said that the Department of Education had sat in judgment of the schools, but did nothing to help. The mission statement that we adopted when I took office is that the Department of Education is a service organization, a service organization dedicating to raising academic outcomes and empower parents. So as a service organization, I felt we had to do something to help the schools. I revived a practice we had when I was last superintendent of schools called improvement teams. These consist of highly qualified teachers and administrators to go out and help the schools. We have completed 1,453 site visits to struggling schools our first year. Much more is to come. These visits included classroom walkthroughs, meetings with principals, teachers, and other staff, improvement planning sessions, leadership coaching, professional development, and other supports. The school improvement team's system that appears to be the most successful based on what schools increased their letter grades and, hold on, and held on to the higher letter grades over the years is called Project Momentum. Project Momentum works with school leaders and teachers to develop the skills, 
leadership, and focus necessary to ensure student outcomes improve. In the schools that have been served so far in Arizona, schools have improved their proficiency scores by more than two times the state average in English and more than three times the state average in math. By the end of last year, we had 80 schools implementing Project Momentum. This year, we hope to double that number, and the last number I saw was going to be more than double. The next initiative is number two. In addition to Project Momentum, another initiative for leadership training. There's an old saying, show me a good school and I will show you a good leader. I know of districts that used to be outstanding, but when their leader retired, their test scores declined substantially. George Washington has said that he would rather have an army of lambs led by, an iron, uh, led by a lion than an army of lions led by a lamb. We have a separate division devoted to leadership training. Last year, more than 900 school leaders attended in-person training. That number will continue to grow. We would ask at the end of the training if they would recommend trainings to colleagues, and 100% of participants said yes. The fifth item I'll talk about is Initiative 14, Paper Reduction, which is also related to school improvement. Reducing unnecessary paperwork so that school staff could concentrate more on educating students. For example, schools in Title I must fill out a form called a Comprehensive Needs Assessment. Over the years, whenever the department needed more information, instead of doing, this is between my two terms there, uh, instead of doing it with an email, they added more questions to the Comprehensive Needs Assessment. We reversed this. We reduced the number of questions in that form from 154 to 20. This leaves more time for school staff to focus on what they should be focusing on, improving student academic performance. Also, to obtain federal and state grants, schools had to fill out complex budget narratives. A number of schools actually passed on the money available, available because the forms were too burdensome. Hard to believe, but they actually pass on the, on the money. We simplified the forms so the schools will get that money to increase academic performance. In addition, kinder, kindergarten teachers were burdened with a totally crazy reading readiness test that took 45 minutes per student during class time away from the other students. We reduced this by 80% so the teachers could spend their time teaching students. This was done with the help of the legislature, and thank you for that. The next initiative is number 12, school safety. My nightmare is that a maniac will walk into a school and kill 20 kids, as has happened in other states, and there is no police officer to protect the students or the staff. If this were to happen, the parents would never recover for the rest of their lives. If they found out that the school could have had a police officer there to prevent the students and the district, it, 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 I'm sorry, it, if they found out the school could have had a police officer to, to protect the students and the district leadership decided not to, you could imagine how they would feel about that decision making. I have advocated vigorously for more schools to hire school safety officers that we pay for from your appropriation. We've increased the number from 190 to 301 schools. The legislation that you passed also um, enables the schools to choose funding for school resource officers or mental health professionals. We were able to continue funding all the 565 previously awarded school counselor social worker positions. The last initiative I want to talk about before opening up to questions is number eight, compiling and publicizing data to bring about higher academics. What you see on the screen, you might think it's modern art, but it's actually a scatter diagram. From left to right is increased poverty as measured by free and reduced lunches. From the lower part to the higher part shows increased math proficiency. We have different diagrams for different skills. This is math. These diagrams are on our website and available to anyone who's interested in the, in the public, as well as to, obviously to you. Just click on, uh, uh, 
the list of hot topics on the page, first page of our website, azed.gov, azed.gov, and go to hot topics and click on the data section. <coughs> Each dot is a school. As designed, if you click on a dot, you will get inform full information on that school. That part will be finished within a couple of weeks. But the but the the diagram is there, and you can put in the name of the school and get the get the information. This gives us important information. For example, the dot that you see there, uh, with it in yellow, is Ash Fork Elementary School, with 80% free and reduced lunch, and almost 50% Hispanic. They had 60% math proficiency compared to the state average of 39%. These kind of statistics show us that poverty is not an excuse, and poor students can learn just as well as richer students if properly taught. In the same general area of the state is another school which I will not name. It has about the same poverty rate as Ash Fork but its math proficiency rather than 60% is less than 2.6%. That school's leadership should visit Ash Fork or at least call to find out what they're doing with students who are at about the same poverty level but with a 66% proficiency rate rather than the school's 2.6%. In general, that's the purpose of this kind of data. What school should confer with what other school on a much higher level but at the same economic level to improve the academics of that school. The vertical comments columns all have about the same poverty rate. Those schools that are dots at the bottom should consult with those schools whose dots are at the top with about the same poverty rate but much higher proficiency to get ideas about how th these other schools could increase their proficiency rate. This is an example of how this kind of data which is now available to the full public, should help increase our overall academic, academic proficiency if used properly. The last thing I will show you is a graph that shows proficiency rate from right to left and graduation rate from top to bottom. This yields some very interesting information. For example, there's a high school with an 80% graduation rate, but only a 2% proficiency rate. The same pattern with slight differences in the numbers is true of several high schools. This is an indication of issuing fraudulent diplomas for students who do not have the minimal skills that employers require. We have complaints from business leaders that applicants now show that they have high school diplomas, but they do not have the minimal skills one would expect of a high school graduate. Also, we need to do a much better job of preparing students to be capable of college work. The national average for people with at least a four-year college degree is 46%. The Arizona average is 30%. If not corrected, this will disadvantage our economy. For, the re for these reasons, my second highest priority of the bills we are re requesting from you is the following. To graduate, a student must either receive a reasonable score on the ACT test that all students take or alternatively be satisfied for skill in a career technical education. That way they're college ready or they're career ready. If the student chooses the ACT option, they would have four chances to take the test, twice their junior year, twice their senior year. The score would be high enough to motivate students to study, but not so high that it prevents students who are willing to study from being able to graduate. If they're not, if they're not special ed they're, they, they, and they study, they'll be able to pass one of these four tests. But, but hopefully no one would be prevented from graduating. That's what happened. Uh, this is the experience we had with the Ames test between 2003 and 2011. Relying on course grades does not work because some teachers are pressured to pass students whether they learn anything or not. One element of proof of this is, the high, is that some of our high schools have reading teachers because students went through a full eight years of school in elementary and middle school and still cannot read. They were just passed along without their skills. Can you imagine that? Six years, eight years, and they still can't read, spending full time in school day after day. I'm, I'm going to depart from my prepared test to tell you about a conversation I had with 
Senator Hoffman this morning, he, and he authorized me to tell you this, he has a couple of friends that teach at Mesa High School, and, he, and they told him the pressure on them to pass students along, whether they've learned anything or not, is incredible. That's a, sh that's a shame, and we've got to put a stop to, to it. During my first eight years as state superintendent, I got to news, know students from other, superintendents from other states pretty well. The smartest one was from Ohio, and she taught me something very important. There are three aspects to quality education. The quality of teachers and teacher leaders, number one. Number two, the quality of curriculum. And number three, the motivation of the students. We, have, we often forget about that third factor. So when I left office and the requirement to pass the AIMS test was eliminated, teachers would ask students to do well on the test because they were being tested. They were being judged based on the students' test scores. And the students would say, why should I? Teachers reported to me that students left early or doodled on the answer sheets rather than answer the questions. We must restore the motivation for students to study. The motivation to study will serve the students well for their futures and will restore the credibility of high school diplomas among employers. And um, uh, it's in the Senate now. I believe it will ultimately pass in third read, and I hope when it gets here you will pass it as well. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much. Members, any questions of Superintendent Horn? Representative Pollack? Thank you, Madam Chair. And Superintendent Horn, thank you for joining us today. It was nice to hear your, your report. As a member of the School Safety Task Force during the interim, I really appreciated the diverse membership of the committee. There were Democrats, there were Republicans, there were people from Maricopa County and the rural counties. We had people from law enforcement, we had mental health care providers. And we heard repeatedly throughout the meetings about the need for a team approach when we are making sure that schools are safe. I was curious to know what the department is doing to promote this team approach now that so many of the bills that had the mental health care provider those bills are dead or that piece has been struck, stricken from the bill. So I was wondering if you can talk about what sure. the department is doing to Yes, now, now we have continued, there are over 500 mental health providers that, uh, that we pay for through your appropriation. Mm -hmm. We've been main, able to maintain all of them. Um, to, to create the teams you're talking about, we would have to have equal numbers and that would require a rather significant appropriation. Obviously, this isn't the year for that when we have a deficit, but when, when there hopefully will be a surplus again, that will be high on our priority list. I want to mention on that committee, we had an equal number of Democrat legislators mm -hmm. and Republican legislatures, and it was a great way to work together. And I, I hope to get bipartisan support for everything I propose, and I'm always willing to be appropriately flexible to achieve that. So I, I'll, I offer to Democrats any time to talk to me about bills I've sponsored. If you want changes, we'll talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Representative Schreiber? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for being here, Mr. Horn, and thank you so much for your, your report. I was especially heartened to hear you call for increases in teacher salaries. Uh, that's something that several of us came to the legislature to try and do because we've been seeing the handwriting on the wall that we're losing more and more teachers all the time and what only one in three students has a permanent qualified teacher anymore. I share your concern that that's a disaster not only for our children and families but also for um, our employers and I'm so glad that you're meeting with our employers. So um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, um, uh, what you think about um, also providing salary increases for others, like um, for our support staff that are so integral to making sure that teachers can do the job that they need to do. So much of what we hear from some of those similar reports is that teachers are overworked and overburdened, and those uh, support staff people are integral. So how do you feel about uh, increasing salaries for them? Yes, Super thank you for the question. Let me tell you um, uh, a little bit about my history on that issue. Um, I served for 24 years on the Paradise Valley School Board, 10 as its president. And whenever we gave raises, we gave equal raises to all groups, uh, classified support and administrators. Um, and when I uh, 
my first two years I was in opposition, so I set new records for uh, for for be on the wrong side of four to one votes and unseconded motions. Uh, then, but then I got two friends elected. There were three of us, and uh, the first thing we did was we eliminated the need to second motion. So I retired the trophy for unseconded motions. Um, but we uh, we always gave first of all. As I mentioned, we always gave equal salaries to all groups. And um, the first thing, one of the first things we did was we cut our administrative staff in half, sent them back to the classroom so we could focus on teacher salaries. Our, our ambition was to have the highest salaries in the state. And uh, we were always second because there was one district on a reservation that got too much federal money for us to compete with. But we were second consistently. So I, I've been fighting for higher salaries for teachers uh, my entire professional life. Uh, now, and, and, and as a school board member, I always felt we should give equal raises. Right now, the emergency is teachers. So mm -hmm. I'm supporting the, the, the leadership bill to focus on teachers. And I'm hoping the districts can become more efficient and they can make up for it with the classified employees. May I follow up, please? One last one, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'll save my second question for later and let somebody else go. Well, in uh, looking at the, the time constraints, we're gonna move on fairly soon, so we're just gonna start wrapping this up. So, Representative Diaz? Uh, yes, Mr. Horn. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Horn. Uh, so, and I, th I think I heard you answer that question, but I, um, I think it was also kind of uh, veiled in the in in the answer that you or the presentation that you just gave. So, uh, what is the department doing to keep the balance of administrative costs and teacher pay? That's one of the things that I think that we hear a lot is that administration is getting much more. We we did a study that showed the, that the more money that the schools have put more money in the classroom as opposed to district office administration. Mm -hmm. School administration sometimes sometimes you need people you know, for discipline, for one thing. But district office administration, I think in many districts, is very wasteful. And um, we did a study, and we found that those schools that, or those districts that put, that had a higher percentage of money going in the classroom of, uh, versus district office did better academically than those that spent more on administration. Um, we sent out a press release no one paid attention, so we have to find a way to call attention to that. But in the meantime, I, I've been exhorting, this, you know, school boards, to to take take note of this. Um, we've got to. No school is better than the quality of the teacher in the classroom. We've got to pay our teachers as well as we possibly can, and I think uh, we have a problem with some districts that have too much administration, and frankly, small districts that that don't have economies of scale. So they have to have a principal and they have to have a couple of other people, even though they have a small number of students, it increases the percentage of district office administration. Mm -hmm. And when I was here, uh, every year I was here, I had a bill to, um, to consolidate, but it never, it never got through because I know small districts have a lot of political influence. Superintendent Horn, I just want to say thank you. And uh, we started an hour late, so uh, in order to try to get back on track a little bit, I'm going to get going to the uh, uh, the bills at hand. So I really appreciate you coming today. I, uh, I will stay to answer any questions on that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, right so, after the sponsor, I'd like to appear for any questions on that bill. All right. Thank you. That'll be the first one up. So uh, the bill numbers going forward are going to be the first one is SB 1459. Second one is SB 1182. Third, SB 1369, and the last one is SB 1304. So, Mr. Vice Chairman, please move Senate Bill 1459. Madam Chair, I move that Senate Bill 1459 be returned with the due pass recommendation. Ryan, can you please explain the bill? Madam Chairman, members, 
Senate Bill 1459 requires a school district or charter school to annually report to ADE the total number of student discipline referrals submitted by teachers, the number of reported referrals for which school administration implemented disciplinary action, and the percentage of reported referrals for which school administration did not implement disciplinary action. The bill prohibits a school from discouraging a teacher from submitting a student discipline referral and allows a teacher who is the 